I'm going to switch it up because this morning kind of, um, um, I'm pre Morpilla, by the way. Yes, I did fly 14 hours yesterday to get here, and I'm enjoying um, Poland quite, quite. It's, it's quite nice. It's a little cooler than San Francisco, but um, it's a beautiful city, and I'm going to get a tour this afternoon. But I want to give you a little background. So um, I started my firm in 1991. And that was in Sunnyvale, California. No one knows where that is, but that's the Silicon Valley. Um, and I, my career pretty much started in Sunnyvale, Fremont, Palo Alto. So I would say I've spent probably the better part of my career, 30 years of it, in one territory. So I've seen sort of all the different iterations of workplace strategy. And what I want to do is kind of give you an insight of how it's progressed, what, what changes we're seeing, and it really directs, relate, it directs re really closely to what we're talking about. Axel, Boris, and um, Ilka are exactly right on. And what I want to show you is kind of where we came from, where we're headed, and contextually, how does it really work in the workplace? Because we definitely have a different type of worker who is very, um, they're very um, passionate about what they do, but they're also um, extremely used to working in technology, used to working in different types of spaces. So I think that's where you're seeing the cause and effect. You're seeing workspaces that have to be more fluid, more flexible. And what I want to do is show you how we strategize that space so you can better be informed when you begin working on space, when you begin talking to tenants. Because a lot of this stuff, the WeWork space is not clearly or well defined. But I think what we can do is kind of show you some of the thinking behind it so when it's when it comes up for you to kind of discuss or to strategize about, you really understand what the components are. So I'm going to quickly switch over to this presentation, which I think is going to be a little bit more helpful for today's presentation. Where's the, uh... Oscar's probably pissed off right now because <laughs> I gave him my presentation and I just switched it on him right now. But um, I kind of, I want it to be useful and I want it to relate to what we're talking to about right now. So this is um, actually, I'm going to start off with um, what we call Workplace Evolve. So we kind of are going to go through a couple of, a couple of um, 10 topologies that we've developed. And these are workplace topologies that we feel kind of help describe the way people. Yes. These 10 topologies are um, kind of the way we strategize space. And you've seen them. And you've, seen, you've heard different definitions. You're going to hear what O plus A has come up with in terms of how we define space. So kind of right away, we kind of know that workplace is sort of top of mind for every executive. Every executive discusses it. Uh, it's about retention. It's about recruitment. It's about getting the right people. Um, how do we inspire and how do we get employee engagement? It's, it's kind of a big topic. Um, even in the Valley, as, as long as they've had workforce, it's changed so much on them. They've had to adopt. They've got newer companies doing different things with the workplace, like the Facebooks and the Ubers. So it makes the Apple space and it makes the Intel space, it makes a lot of these spaces already irrelevant in this fast moving market. And, and this is global. So we've learned that even in their global markets where they're setting up, they need to adopt these new workplace strategies. So this is kind of an interesting topic in our least article in the Harvard Business Review. It's if you're a Google staffer and your name is not Sergey Brin, odds are work is better than your home. And that's kind, of a, that's kind of the truism that is, is kind of spread across workplace, not just in the Silicon Valley, but globally. The workplace, because we spend the time there, the hours are longer, we're looking for engagement, we're looking for more curated, we're looking for spaces that inspire. If you're going to work long hours, it better be a great space to be. And we're working longer hours. So. Um, Here's kind of three people that, and Marissa Mayer is no longer Yahoo CEO, but I put these three pictures here because Steve Jobs, when he developed Pixar, I don't know if anybody knows, kind of the big takeaway from Pixar was the atrium. And that's when they had animators and engineers, and they were trying to come up with something for, for one of their films, and they couldn't ever get 
enough meetings going in order to solve the problem. So what did he do? He put one lunchroom, one big area where at least one, one time of the day the engineers and the developers and the animators had to cross paths. So you hear about this kind of this engineered serendipity, these aha moments. This is kind of what the valley lives on. The valley lives on the fact that the faster they can innovate, the more places they can have innovation, the more likely they're going to hit a home run or have several successes as opposed to the linear way which management used to go up through the levels and finally the idea would be explored. This way we have many more ideas. So the atrium is kind of significant in workplace design in the valley. Marissa Mayer, when she took over Yahoo, basically Yahoo did have a work from home policy, but it was probably not one day, it was probably several days a week. So when she took over Yahoo, her goal was to kind of reshift the company, kind of reorganize, and she took away that policy. It was controversial in the valley. Everybody's going, holy, this is terrible. But it actually, she needed it in order to kind of reinforce new business ideas, get everybody on the same page. So the workplace and the office is not going anywhere. It's a living, even though we have WeWork spaces and we're probably working in smaller footprint, the office is still a place where we gather, where we, social, where we socialize, where we com compare ideas. It's hard to do that over the internet. It's hard to do that online. But face to face, you can do it. So the office is really not going anywhere. And then the, the last photo is Mark Zuckerberg. We were lucky enough to work with Facebook on their first headquarters in, in Palo Alto. Facebook was comprised of five offices in downtown Palo Alto. Their first move to 1601 California was our first project with them. And it was more important to them to have the cultural touchstones represented in the space, not any purple slides, not any colors that were very juvenile, but give the people what they need to work. And that was, again, expressing what the values were of Facebook. It wasn't about the nice, the nice offices with, with kind of this very, very sort of uh, kind of hipster look. It was more about give them what they need. And, and that became sort of the moniker. So if you go to any Facebook facility today, the Frank Gehry spaces, it's all about just enough design, just enough to give the people what they need to do, nothing more. So it's, in a way, it's, it's a, very, a very unique point of view and it and has served Facebook very well. So, this is probably, um, I, I kind of like to show this because this is the office topologies of just 10 years ago. You got a hard wall office desk, you have a cubicle, and you have a conference room. These three components serve the office market for the last 40 years. We've designed with it, people know it, the ratios are kind of set in stone. Developers go, well, I need three big conference rooms, I need a bunch of hard wall offices for the leadership, and then I need a big pull, bullpen for workstations. People still plan that way but we're seeing a big shift. And I want to show you kind of a good example of, this is a Microsoft building in 1980. This is densified with hard wall offices. The only way they could get people to go up to Redmond, Washington, if you've ever been there, it's like in the forest. There's nothing there. <laughs> you basically got a hard wall office. You went up there, you got a hard wall office, that was the big attraction. So what do you do now when you have so much inventory like this? You've got a lot of square footage. Uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Boeing have the biggest square footages in, in Washington State. They have a million square feet of building like this. You hire O plus A or you hire a consultant. You have somebody take a look at it. How can we democratize? How can we take down some of what is typically a hierarchical office structure? How do we make it less hierarchical? So we begin take, taking, taking away some of what you would think are your typical trappings for a hard wall office perimeter offices, you, you open up the middle, you create interaction points. So these hashed areas down the middle where the staircases, where lunch areas would be, and where people would potentially meet and mix. So think of it like a mixer. So the idea is that we begin taking away what would typically be hardwell offices, we put open offices on the perimeter. So we're now beginning to share the light. We're democratizing the space, we're making the space so every part, every office, every viewpoint has access to nature. So we're trying to take away um, design that had been embedded with hierarchy and flatten it. And here are the ten, ten topologies. Um, and from these ten, these are just kind of conversation starting points. When the people talk about open plan, they don't really understand, well, just put a bunch of desks in the middle. Well, you don't put a lot of desks in the middle and, and not think about phone rooms, ancillary meeting spaces, lounges, living room, things, things that are going to hopefully um, Brings, bring people together. 
or, or, or give them a little time for rest. We need to think about all the rituals of individuals during that day and how they work. Because I work differently in the morning than Axel does, I'm sure, than Boris does, I'm sure. He, you know, I, don't, I don't open a sports page, but I, he might. <laughs> uh, I get my cup of coffee and maybe I go to my desk. Or maybe I don't go to my desk. Maybe I hang out in a lunch area. We don't know. That's the thing. Everybody's different. So the way we start our day needs to have the ability to pick and have choice. So these 10 topologies, which I'm going to go over in detail, and these, mind you, are all specifically O plus A projects for clients, and you're going to see the differences. Every client has its own personality. Everybody wants to express themselves differently. You're finding that this sort of uh, universal fit design doesn't really play in the office of the future. We want these personalized, curated experiences based on my company's values, how I want to express them, and how I want to tell them to anybody who walks through the door. So they look very different by design. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the living room. Living room, think of it as a lounge space, but think of it very casual furniture. Think about what you do in the living room. You know, you kick your feet up, you relax, you kind of take pause, and your interaction with somebody is usually more nuanced and more casual and more relaxed. We want that because that, that type of interaction is less formal than a conference room. We want people to talk. We want people to feel comfortable. So the right away, the living room setting, this is, of all places, Cisco Systems. So we have just done all the re, re basically it's called the reboot. All the Cisco offices in San Jose no longer look like Cisco Mauve, I mean, just 65-inch high panels. They now are beginning to look like living rooms or we work spaces, spaces that might feel more residential and more hospitality by design. To the left is Uber. Um, this is an Uber facility. Each, each area has a very different feel. Um, these are a venture firm on the right. Um, again, feels like a living room. So the fireplace, the whole residential, we call it, there's a new term. It's called resi Mercial. Resi Mercial. It's very, very popular. <laughs> uh, if, you, if, if you haven't heard it, that's what, that's what we're calling it. So it's residential commercial. Um, Uber's lobby. Uh, this is kind of an onboarding lobby for Uber. So when people come on and they become Uber employees, this is exactly, you know, instead of being greeted by a very cold and formal lobby, it's kind of a welcoming. It's a lobby where you can hang out. You can have a cup of coffee. You wait to be received, but you don't have to wait in a cold environment. Um, and, and it's Living room can kind of, kind of can change. So you can kind of see area one in front of this big screen. You can kind of see area two. They all have a different look and feel. And we want that. We want to curate it because we know that when we do it, and we do it with sort of this love and care, people want to use that space. If we just replicate it and clone stamp this one plan 50 times over in a building, guess what? Nobody uses those spaces. That's the last thing they want to go to. You want to go to places you feel comfortable and you want to feel like there's been sort of uh, in kind of care put into the making of the space. Some more diff types of Uber. So think tank, think tank, think of it as a conference room that is about a quarter size of a normal size conference room. So think of it a two and three person conference room. You can save space, you can kind of maximize the footprint. If you have a bunch of these small rooms, then building large 10 to 15 person conference room. Um, it's, it's, it's a room that can actually also double up as a work area. So when you're thinking of space and you're strategizing, maybe you think about putting these in as opposed to putting large conference room. Uh, this is a um, couple of different ways we've done it. But they're usually on the order of about five by five or even smaller. They're very small, what I would say, quarter size rooms, conference rooms. You can kind of see, they all take on a different look. And we want people to know that, hey, you know, this is representative of the brand. We're kind of take some of the cues and we're going to design it appropriately. So it's been done with intent. So individual work areas, uh, we do have a lot of benching, but we still do private offices. And we've actually managed to get that private office down to a very, very small size if need be. Because the private office is kind of representative of what I would say office office of the um, sort of an older standard, but for some HR or cons types, of types of work that need private space, you do need private space. Uh, this is Yelp. I don't know if we have Yelp here, but this is the open plan uh, for Yelp. We use a benching system and sit-to-stand stations. 
This is my office in San Francisco. All benching, kind of very open plan. Uber, this is kind of a hoteling. There's no desktops, it's all mobile. So you can hook up and use kind of any of these spaces. And this is kind of a really interesting study that we did. We actually curated a space on the right here. Um, it was for a month, we actually designed the space and we put an end user every week in the space. So we designed these little units, essentially they were like building blocks, thinking of it as like gigantic Legos. And each end user, it was an architect, a taxidermist, a toy designer, and an urban planner, they would design the space for their best use. So it would be customized. The idea is that if we had the ability to customize our workstation, would we do it? We probably would. So furniture is changing that way now. You're seeing the ability to actually modify your workstation. We're doing it at Cisco. Um, people are not just sitting kind of facing each other. We actually give them the ability to turn 90 degrees or recreate their space. In Europe, you have a lot of um, raised floor, which makes it great for it. In America, we do everything from the walls and poles and workstations, so you're kind of fixed. But um, if you have a grid and you can kind of lay out a good strategy on the floor, you can give the ability to, to move the workstation around. This is actually uh, Microsoft, and this is a six foot by eight office. So it's six foot wide, fits a 30 inch desk. You have backup space, and it's eight foot deep, so you can have a side chair and somebody sit with you. But it's very compact. The door doesn't swing in. It's a barnyard door. But instead of putting one office, we can put two offices in the same size space. And then here's some workstations. It's actually a piece I designed for Kimball. This is actually a workstation product that over the years of designing tons of custom workstations, um, this is a new product that's been released by Kimball. Everything sit to stand. It's very module. Every module you can kind of fit a conference area, a meeting space. So it has the ability to kind of fit different types of work settings within the framework of the product. So studios. Studios are actually, think about a work studio like in an architect's office or a graphic design firm. They tend to be very collaborative. They tend to really kind of promote interaction. And usually that has to do a lot more with posture and a little bit of the design. So what we do there is that there's usually, uh, it's a space in the open plan. It's usually a desk or a conference area. It's usually standing height. It's usually something that you can get into, have a quick 10 minute sit down. You can meet with your colleagues and then you kind of pull away. So it's not quite a conference room. It's a little bit of this more informal, high benching type work setting. Um, we put them a lot in hallways and next to whiteboards and they're always used. So think of it as like a very, very impromptu scrum type meeting uh, that you might need and you can just build the hallways up and they could be two different heights, they could be made out of concrete, concrete. They, can quite, they can be quite beautiful. So workshop is um, a space that we discussed with our clients in that you need a space where there's no technology. So the absence of technology is kind of the new thing in the valley. It's like, can we put our devices down for a while and just kind of talk to each other? Maybe not Boris, but some people can. <laughs> the idea is that we are on our devices and we are hardwired. I'm going to show you another topology that we've developed for a show, but this is something that we feel um, working on your bike, working with your hands, putting a tool shop in. Um, these are areas specifically made where we don't want you to start kind of working on your laptop or your iPad. We want you to focus on something uh, music rooms are very popular. We actually have rooms where you can shut the doors, they have curtains, or they have insulation material. Uh, in our office, we actually have a little workshop where you can build stuff. Um, and why not play poker? I mean, games, <laughs> this doubles as a conference room, it also turns into a poker table. Uh, these doors fold down, turns into a conference room, but um, we know, and I learned this actually working from uh, on the PayPal headquarters, that uh, we had rooms that just had board games in them and magazines. So we'd set them up. And we knew that basically the CEO had read an article in the Harvard Business Review that said, hey, if these guys play board games and they read a book, they'll be like 25% more productive. So we put them all over the place, and it was really good. People liked to hang out. They did, again, getting away, doing more analog things during the day, five, 10 minutes to your day, kind of just exercises a different part of the brain. Um, town hall, um, sort of the continuing learning environment. 
And um, if you want to kind of have a big release or you have something that you want to explain to the staff, and usually these all-hand meetings exist in a lot of companies, we've kind of lost the training room. The training room has now become this because now you can train anywhere on your um, computer. You can do training right at the desktop. So we have these great big rooms that serve food, that can, you can pull away the tables, and screens drop down, and you can have big meetings in them. So you'll see oftentimes they look kind of like canteens and cafeterias, but what they are is just another way to meet. And they're very, very kind of public, almost, I would say, hospitality inspired. So they do have a little bit of a restaurant feel to them. But the idea is that I'm going to come in and out of meetings and I want to do kind of some of these big events in a large space, but I also want to have my clients see the space and do meetings there. Um, or I want to work there quietly. And sometimes it's important that <laughs> you have a bar. Um, it's funny, this, this company actually loved going to happy hour and they felt like they did their best work at happy hour. So we put like a pub in the bottom of their space which was the basement um, and it's all wired. You can, say, you can push presentations, they had a big Star Wars fan there. But all these places, there was Wi-Fi, there were plugins, you can push your presentations to all the different screens. Um, so why not, have a, why not have that kind of setting? It's really, it's kind of really up to the individual company. So um, library is a, um, is a space that we feel like in the open plan, uh, the big knock on open plan is that it's noisy and you can't control kind of voice. This is sort of the cacophony of sounds become almost like you can't work in this space. So we've set up libraries which are in the open plan and the protocol is you work quietly there. So work in groups, but work quietly there. Some of them, you know, look more or less like lounges, but they are spaces where you want people to kind of collect and work together, but you want them to work quietly. And sometimes they look like libraries. The um, kind of what I call in between living room and then our little conference rooms are these shelters. And these are very popular. They are sort of somewhat sequestered. They have usually a little bit of a surround, and they used to have insulation around them. But they're not typically book bookable. They're not on a booking system. They're they're kind of in the open plan, and it's easy to put these in. Uh, they don't require a door. They don't require any extra mechanical. Really, they just need a little nook and a little place for people to kind of hang out. And a lot of times uh, you'll see, this was actually the first one that Square ever did. So when we were working with Square and Jack Dorsey wanted a new type of workspace or a conference room, we developed this and it became the most popular one and they use these regularly. You see these a lot now. These are very popular at the shelter. Um, they're usually aligned with acoustical material. So actually when the sound waves go in, they sort of deaden. So you get a very nice kind of quiet, non-reverberation type space all different types of shapes and spaces. This actually here is actually Capital One in San Francisco. And um, it was a, a place where they would fly in executives from Virginia and they'd come here and they'd kind of learn about design thinking and about different ways to use space. So again, you can kind of use these as sort of teaching moments also. The workspace can be um, effective that way. So anywhere is really kind of taking advantage of transitory routes, kind of in spaces that you would normally not think of as being part of the office. And we like to take advantage of them because we know that on route to places, actually that's where the aha moment or the, the moment where you have to jot down an idea happens. And if you don't have a whiteboard, if you don't have a place to do kind of the ideation, you don't get an opportunity. So we try to use, I'm sorry, we try to use all these different spaces as opportunities to, to kind of either work with somebody or kind of take a moment to yourself, um, you know, jot down an idea, um, put, a, put, a, put an outlet there, put some technology, put some soundproofing material, and maybe you might work in that corridor. Rather than just having a transitory space, make it an opportunity for a moment or a time for you to maybe chat with your colleague and not feel like you need to book a conference room. Probably the biggest thing that we always face is like there's not enough conference rooms, there's not enough space to do my work. So we try to take and leverage kind of every inch of the floor plate. Bay windows, staircases, in between spaces. Um, we, try to, we try to utilize as much of the floor plate that you would think is just transitory and use it as, again, another type of workspace, even outdoor space. So the war room and the conference rooms, we still have them. Um, they are um, more 
transparent. They're more filled with devices, so there's a lot of technology. Um, they're still fussy. They still don't turn on right away when you do them. We're still waiting for that perfect technology that syncs up. And I'm going to show you some stuff that we've done some mic for Microsoft that kind of addresses that. Um, but we still have beautiful conference rooms. People um, like to have them as usually the centerpiece of their office. So I'm going to switch to my main presentation. Is Oscar here? Can we go to the, um, the first slide package that I gave you, and then we'll go to the video. Oh, you know what? I think you have. Do I have? Oh, I got it. I got it. Oh, you're good. Okay, we are. Um, we're getting towards the end of my presentation, so I apologize. <laughs> but I wanted to show you that because it puts all this into kind of um, order and context for you. So you got the long version. So this is actually um, a new space that we've developed for Microsoft. And it is in Redmond. And it is about Office of the Future and conferencing in the future. Um, this might be what the office looks like in the future. Um, we're going to have probably fully immersive conferencing. So these are actually done with some of the Microsoft product. There are like 32 cameras in this conference room. So you can catch your kind of every gesture, kind of where they are in the room. And then the people that come into the meeting, they're actually, they're kind of like in the space with you. The idea is that Microsoft wanted to make this feel like if I had a big warehouse or I had a space and I want to plop down this conferencing unit, it'd be very mobile and be very easy to kind of put in any kind of meeting space or building. Um, we're going to have sound absorption material. We're going to have daylighting, um, probably that tied to the circadian rhythm. So this daylight system actually ties to the outside. So as the day changes, if I'm deep in the building, the lighting changes. So it mimics the sun. Um, so we kind of get our sort of our sleep habits and everything is kind of tied to this. So there's a, a kind of a huge kind of um, there's a, a lot of technology now that we can put easily into the building that tie it to a lighting system that does different color ranges and changes during the day. Um, different type of furnishing, things that are probably uh, more acoustically sound, um, that are very, very much like that one space I showed you that's flexible. This idea that we can kind of build our office, that we can configure it. All these pieces are made to pick up and move. So I can create different type of settings, lecturing settings, or just kind of quiet little nooks. Um, these tables move. All this can be disassembled and put back together and reconfigured. This, um, we actually saw some of these. These are just more kind of the Uber settings. I'm going to quickly go through this, and I'm going to go to our last project, Nike, if you want to see Nike. OK, so the last project here is what we did at uh, Milan last year. So at Saloni de Mobile, we were asked to go, what would be, if we were to take office of the future, what would be some of the things that we might need? Um, and we kind of felt it was a, it's a good time to actually kind of explore the idea that um, with all the technology and kind of with with, with sort of like not being able to control the silence, we kind of feel like this is going to be a big part because we do have a lot of um, we have a lot of we have a lot of issues with this space being too connected. We are we are so connected to our devices. Do we do we need respites during the day that actually quiet the brain? Because you 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 have those days. You have those days when you can't get unstuck and just kind of like, gosh, if I could take a walk around the block or if I can do something, maybe I can kind of jar my brain and kind of shift and get that transitory moment where, oh, OK, I got it. So what we developed was this, essentially it was a journey. And the journey was like four different settings. And these journeys had a little bit of a ritualistic aspect to it. You either had to put on a jacket 
or you had to put on a backpack. And around these little settings, you would actually build these pieces, and that would begin your kind of, that would begin your experience. So the first one here was sort of the, the, the pond. And the pond was actually this video projection of this beautiful kind of serene water element. So it was a water sculpture designed by um, an artist. And then these seats that you see around it were actually part of the um, ritual. You'd put on this backpack and you'd build the stool and you'd sit around the pond and the lights would come on and the whole piece would start. So after about two minutes, you wouldn't even realize you were in the exhibit hall. You would just kind of focus in on this pond. Um, and I'm going to show you a video how that actually worked. The second setting was actually a recline. You were looking at this cloud and you'd see these water elements. So again, we're, we're kind of mimicking nature in a way, but these moments of respite and these moments of sort of this transitory state where you're kind of, you're kind of, you're kind of stressed out during the day, we think that maybe a couple of times during the day, this is a space you should go to. Maybe pre-meeting, maybe before you start something, uh, you want to kind of relax the brain. We don't have a lot of spaces to relax our brain right now. So what can we do to kind of help facilitate that in the workplace? We've got great workstations. We've got great conference rooms. What if we could have spaces that help you rest, that help you regenerate your battery? So the idea was that the ritual of putting the jacket on and putting this thing, you began to become a part of the experience. Um, a lot of this is sort of fascinating because we do have our rituals, and if we and if we kind of think about it, the things that we do, like go camping or sit in nature, we don't really do anymore. We, we don't have the time, or we feel we don't have the time. So we're expressly trying to insert it into the workplace, make those moments a little bit more a part of your day. And, and you know, what if it is part of the workstation to be a part of you? Uh, what if some of the things that uh, kind of we take for granted at the desk, what if we just kind of make it a part of your daily routine? A, a little bit is kind of playful in fashion, but we go, you know, design and interiors can be that way. I mean, this is, this is not a timeless, iconic building. This is an interior experience that almost mix, mimics like fashion. Design and the workspace changes, and that's because the different users and the different people, that, they all have different approaches and perceptions of space. We actually feel that it's good to change your space every three to four years. Here's a little bit of the backpack. It's kind of fun. Um, we actually had an experience designed by Microsoft. So Microsoft developed a part of one of these experiences, sort of this ice sculpture that when you put on the visor, you kind of stared at it and all of a sudden these elements and you'll see how that works. Um, so let me show you the video real quick. And that was it. So uh, it was kind of, uh, it went for four or five days and it was actually, it was really heavily visited. We didn't realize how many people would come and sit and kind of fall asleep in the thing. So <laughs> we were waking up a lot of people. Um, but um, thank you very much. Uh, I, um, we do, there's actually an interesting, this was just published by Frame. So this is actually, we just came out, it's called 12. 12 True Tales of the Workplace. So this is um, a, a little bit about O plus A and a couple of projects that we've done. So this, this, this is now available. It just, it just came out. And then for any of you who want to know more about the topologies we've published, this, this is actually a book that I used to teach with. Uh, I teach this course in, in, the, in, in, in a university. So the topologies are something that um, 
we do have some literature on. So if you didn't get enough of it, um, leave me your card and I'll, I'll get you one of these books. Um, but thank you very much. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I'm, I'm a little early. 